let's proceed to the second general approach. And you will see that it's actually a lot simpler and maybe even clearer. And you will ask yourself, why did I not present this first? And maybe only this. Because, because not only it's easier to comprehend, it's also more general. The answer is, I really was genuinely convinced that this concavification approach was more intuitive and more visual. But now I'm starting to doubt myself. So I might reconsider this order for next year's course. But so, what can we tell about this concavification approach? So, it kind of yields a nice visual representation of what happens, of what this Bayesian persuasion entails, if you understand this visual representation. But the truth is, it's not really super convenient to use. So it's a very graphical concept, which means you can see the graph, but you do not necessarily see analytically what happens. You can kind of see what the posteriors are, but if you are drawing things by hand, you will not see what the exact posteriors you want to implement in your optimal experiment, for example, right? And then it's difficult to prove that these are exactly the posteriors that you want to implement. Then the fact that you basically use a picture means that you are effectively restricted to settings with binary states. So if you have two states, you can draw this one-dimensional belief phi. And you have a two-dimensional picture like this one. If you have three states, then you need two values to parameterize the belief phi, which means that you will have two axes for the belief and one axis for the payoffs, which means you will have a three-dimensional graph which is not impossible, but usually very inconvenient to analyze. And then if you have more states than three, you basically need a very rich imagination to draw those graphs in your head. So this method is not very generalizable. It, doesn't, it does not work well for more than two states. And I already told you that it only really works for public persuasion if you have more than one player. So you cannot confidently do private persuasion problems with this method. And that's why partly we're considering this other method, which goes by moniker of actual information design, while the previous method went by Bayesian persuasion. And this new method was developed by Bergman and Morris. And you can read this Bergman and Morris survey if you want to know more about it. And uh, it's... If you are familiar with somewhat intermediate game theory, if you're familiar with the concept of correlated equilibria, then this second approach is kind of very related to correlated equilibria. Well, actually, the first concavification approach took its root, the analytical methods, from the old literature on repeated games. So nothing is new, is new under the sun. So how does this second method work? I told you that in the second method, we will have a, a different kind of revel revelation principle theorem. So what, what we did in the first approach, we said, the message should tell you exactly what to think, and then the principle can calculate what the players will do given what they think. It seems like there is an extra step there that we can get rid of. In particular, why don't we just tell the players what to do? Right? It's not that much different. And it's actually even better if we're talking about private persuasion, because we're giving them even maybe slightly less information. We're not telling them what exactly their posterior should be, but we're just telling them what to do. And so this is the idea behind this second revelation principle. So. We introduce an object that's called a decision rule. <clears throat> and this will be given by the sigma, which maps states into distributions of action profiles. So action profile is a vector of actions for every player, and we maybe mix over those in every state. Realization of this decision rule will be an action recommendation to every player. And so, yeah, recomm these recommendations may be random given states, hence this distribution. But the interesting part is that these recommendations can also be correlated across players. So if you think of public persuasion, it was the case in which recommendations were, in a sense, perfectly positively correlated. 
So we are saying the same thing to all players. Now, when we can look at private persuasion as well, we can say that different players get different recommendations. They can be independent or they can be correlated as in case of public persuasion. So we will use these decision rules as yet another representation of an experiment. So to recap, we defined an experiment as this pair of mu and m, the set of possible messages, and a mapping from sets into distributions of, uh, over these message profiles. This is kind of the canonical, the broadest representation. With Revelation Principle 1 and some other result, we said that we do not need that kind of generality. We can represent the whole experiment as tau, a distribution over posteriors that players can have. So, in a sense, you can think of tau as equivalent to being an experiment. Different taus are different experiments. Now we're introducing this third representation of an experiment. We're saying that a decision rule is also an experiment. So for any decision rule that satisfies some uh, constraints, similar to incentive compatibility, any decision rule that satisfies these requirements will be, a be able to, generate, to be generated by an experiment. And conversely is, once again, the trivial part, every experiment mu generates some kind of decision rule. It generates some kind of distribution over action profiles conditional on the state. So just one last time, one tiny explanation. What we mean by representing experiment by decision rule is we're saying instead of providing any information to the players explicitly, we're just telling them what they should do. So consider our classical example of me going to the beach. If it's sunny, I want to go to the beach. If it's rainy, I don't want to go to the beach. In the first uh, revelation principle, we said that we do not need to do the winks and other hidden signals, rubbing the nose or anything like that. We can just say in plain text, the mechanism can say to me, the experiment can tell me whether it is sunny or rainy. Now we are saying that instead of doing that, instead of saying what belief I should have, the experiment should tell me, yeah, it's a good weather for going to the beach, or no, you should not go to the beach. So this will be a decision rule uh, for me that the experiment will kind of generate based on the true state of the world. So this recommendation will be uh, correlated with the true state of the world. Now, how do we use it? What are the set of good decision rules that we can use? This constraint is the, effectively the incentive compatibility constraint that we know and love. It says that whenever the experiment recommends some action to the player, the player should in fact find it optimal to play this action. Period. So plain and simple. In general, you need to think about the beliefs that the player will have about the states and then calculate the possible expected utility over states. And in general, this condition is what you get once you do all of that. So what does this condition tell us? It takes the sum of all states and all profiles of other players. So in a sense, you should see it as Bayesian incentive compatibility constraint. It's not dominant strategy incentive compatibility. So we do not need this condition to hold for every profile of actions of other players. And so we take the sum of payoffs, of payoff that the player will get, given this action AI and A minus I and the state omega, times the probability of receiving this recommendation AI and other players receiving this recommendation A minus I and the state being this omega. So this joint probability of all this happening together is the probability of state omega happening is given by the prior belief, phi zero of omega. And the probability of this given action profile being recommended is given by the sigma for this action profile given this state omega. 
So once again, this is the joint probability of AI, A minus I and Omega happening together. And then you take the sum over AIs and Omegas. This will give you the expected payoff given that you received recommendation AI. Now, the only subtlety that I'm kind of omitting here is that this, what I've uh, highlighted here in yellow, is the joint probability of these three objects happening together, AI, A minus I and Omega. This is not the conditional probability of this happening given that you received recommendation AI. So to, to write this down as a proper IC condition, you would want this to be a conditional probability. But what we are saying is that you will have this probability of receiving recommendation AI in the right hand side, which is the expected utility of taking action AI. And on the right hand side of the IC condition, you will have the expected utility of taking any other action AI prime, given that you received recommendation to play AI, which happens with this joint probability divided by the probability of receiving action AI. So these probabilities will kind of cancel out on the two sides. So this will be probability of AI in the denominator here, and same probability of action AI in the de denominator of this right-hand side here. And you see that they cancel out. So, but broadly speaking, this condition says exactly that. If we recommend the player to play action AI, it should indeed be optimal for the player, in terms of their expected utility, to select this action AI, as opposed to selecting any other action AI prime. And to distinguish this from incentive compatibility, at least to some extent, we call this the obedience constraint. So the players will behave as we ask them to. Do players know what recommendations all other players receive? And the answer is no. The players only see their own recommendation. And from that, they infer what other recommendations the other players could have received. Right? So, for example, if, uh, if our designer wants to maximize beach participation, from the fact that I received a recommendation to go to the beach, I infer that it's probably because it will be sunny tomorrow. From that, I infer that all other players probably received the recommendation to go to the beach as well. Well, if I received the recommendation to not go to the beach, I infer that all other players probably received the same. So, I do not directly observe those, but my own recommendation that I hear can convey some information about the recommendations that other players received. So, this is kind of the revelation principle theorem, as you can call it, which says that this decision rule sigma can be induced by an experiment, by some experiment meaning, if and only if sigma satisfies obedience. So, as we said, it is trivial that any experiment generates some kind of decision rule. But the converse is the non-trivial part. So, it is not trivial whether we can pick a random decision rule and then we can find an experiment that generates this decision rule. So, this theorem tells us that this is possible. Which means that we can basically try to select the optimal sigma that maximizes the uh, designer's expected payoff that we will now call v small v0 star of sigma, which is defined as the average payoff that the principal receives, uh, given action profile A and state omega, average with respect to the probabilities of action profile A and state omega arising simultaneously. So here these probabilities sum up to 1, because the sum of probabilities of all given action profiles given the state sum, sums up to 1. And then the sum of probabilities of all the different states also sums up to 1. So why is this a better problem than what we had before? Than the concavification problem. The main benefit, the main advantage 
is that this is a linear programming problem. So if you had a course on linear programming, you are probably imbued with an idea that linear programming is the kind of the simplest thing there is in the world. Whether you believe it or not is a separate question, but from the computational perspective, this is actually true. If you feed in a linear programming problem into a computer, it will solve it in a matter of uh, faster than I can think of in a matter of what it can solve it. Even if it is a very high, highly dimensional problem. So why is this a linear problem? Now note that you are maximizing over sigma. Your objective function is v0 star sigma. And here you see that it is linear in sigma in these probabilities of different action profiles given states. And then you have a bunch of constraints, mostly obedience constraints, meaning that of which you have plenty. So there is one for every player, every action of this player and every other action of this player. So quite a few. But you can see that all of these constraints are also linear in sigma. They are linear in probabilities because, well, sigma is a probability and uh, all the terms here are expected utilities. And expected utilities are linear in probabilities. So you have this obje linear objective function, you have a bunch of linear obedience constraints, and then you'll also have a bunch of linear feasibility constraints, which are just technical uh, restrictions saying that all sigmas are between zero and one, and sigma of a omega, the sum of them over all possible a's, should sum up to one for every omega. So it will generally be a big problem, especially if you have a, a few players with many with large action sets, but you can solve this problem on the computer quite, quite easily, quite quickly. This easily extends to private persuasion. It can also even somewhat extend to players having private information before participating in the, in the experiment, in the mechanism. So I will not be talking much about it, but you can look at the Bergman Morris survey to get more about that. And the idea is that if you add IC constraints to this problem, for the players be willing to report their true private information before being assigned some, before being recommended some action, then those IC constraints are also linear. So now let us try to use this approach to solve our once again, example with the prosecutor and the judge. And I have just written down the objective function and all the constraints from that problem, and they are here. So to explain them what they look like. The objective function is once again the utility of the prosecutor. In expectation of all recommended action profiles and over all the states. So this is the expected utility for rec recommending action G to convict uh, the suspect guilty. So this sigma of small g given big G is the probability with which you issue this recommendation in a good state or in a guilty state when the suspect is actually guilty. And the second sigma is the probability with which you issue the recommendation to convict the suspect guilty when the suspect is actually not guilty. And these two states, guilty and not guilty, happen with respective probabilities phi zero for guilty and one minus phi zero for non-guilty. So there are two other terms in which you have phi zero times sigma n conditional on g, where you, where you recommend to acquit the subject to claim that they are not guilty. But then the prosecutor gets utility zero, so those two other terms will just reduce to zero, while two, other, two, two of these terms yield utility one, so they are kind of multiplied by one here. Now, this is the objective function of the prosecutor. What are the obedience constraints? So, firstly, the judge must find it optimal to issue verdict guilty when he is recommended so by the prosecutor, 
which means that the posterior belief of the judge in the subject's guilt, in the subject's guilt, must be above uh, his belief in the subject's innocence, or this posterior phi must be weakly greater than one half. If you write out those conditional expectations, uh, you will see that it basically reduces to this constraint. I will not write it out explicitly right now. You'll have a similar constraint for the verdict non-guilty. There, the judge must be made sufficiently sure that the subject is indeed non-guilty. So here you kind of see the probability of the exanti probability of non-guilty state times the conditional probability of receiving a verdict in that state, of recommendation, sorry, for a non-guilty verdict, must be above the exanti probability of guilty state times the conditional probability of receiving this verdict, this recommendation in guilty state. So these are the two obedience constraints. And then we have some feasibility constraints. So in particular, the condition in guilty state, some recommendation must be issued, either recommendation to convict the subject or to acquit the subject. But the, to the total probability with which one of the two is issued must be equal to one. Similarly, in the non-guilty state, one of the two recommendations must be issued. So these two probabilities must also sum up to one. And then you also have the, for every of the four sigmas, the restriction on it being between zero and one. And this is the problem that you can feed into MATLAB or Python or Julia or R or whichever else package you're using. And it will tell you that the optimal experiment will be to induce, if the subject is guilty, to always issue the recommendation to convict the subject. Well, if the subject is non-guilty, you issue the recommendation to acquit the subject with this probability, that again also was also derived in the slides for last week in a slightly different way. And with probability one minus this, you get to convict an innocent subject. So as a prosecutor, you're really, really happy. So we have seen two approaches to information design. And if both are applicable, which is mostly a question of whether you can use concavification or not, but if you can, then the two are equivalents, meaning that they will give you the same answer. But in general, the latter approach, this approach with decision rules, is more frequently used, is more frequently usable or applicable. There are a few insights that we can take out from the example that I also tried to convey it last week, and I guess they did not become any clearer this week because we did not really look at the example that much or the driving forces behind the example. <clears throat> but the main takeaways from the example is that you want to make the player perfectly confident that the action that is undesirable to you as a designer is the right one to take. So in the example, the acquitting the subject, saying that the subject is not guilty. This only happens if the judge is perfectly sure that the subject is not guilty. This happens in the optimal experiment because in this case, acquittal then happens with smaller probability, meaning that with larger probability, you get to convict the subject. So by, by imposing this confidence restriction, you can minimize the probability with which players take the action that is undesirable to you as the designer. And on the other hand, for them to take the action that is desirable to you as the designer, you want to make them barely indifferent between taking this action or not. So you want to justify this action to them, but only slightly so. Because, again, if you want to provide full proof that this course of action is optimal, then this action will only be taken if this is indeed the only right course of action. While by leaving this ambiguity in the optimal experiment, you can make... Uh, you can sometimes trick the players into playing against their incentives and into your pocket. Now, there are some other takeaways that we have not seen 
in these two weeks, but that are also present in the, in the literature, in the general field of information design. So first interesting thing is that with many players, it is sometimes optimal for you as the designer to correlate the messages positively, so to issue the same message to everybody, and sometimes negatively, meaning to try to set the agents against one another or try to give them contradicting information, hoping that they will not find out. And which one you prefer depends on the game largely. It's on whether you want to induce coordination among agents or you want to or you want the opposite. You want to miscoordinate the agents. And another another thing is that dynamic information design is also a thing, because why wouldn't it be? And it relates to problems in which the information arrives dynamically over time. So you do not get to learn the state immediately with an experiment, but the experiment can be yield more informative predictions over time. And then your question is, what is the best op way to optimally, to dynamically reveal this dynamically arriving information? And again, I will not torture you with that, but th it, this is a very interesting field. As I said at the very beginning, it's a quite a hot field, quite popular in economics these days. But truth is, it's not maybe that easy to find a real-life setting to which you could apply these instruments. So mechanism design is a more broadly applicable tool, toolbox, tool set. Because in information design, we inherit the same assumption that the designer can commit to some kind of experiment. And even if you think that the some kind of information design can can be uh, happening, it is really difficult to justify this commitment assumption. It's really difficult to say that the designer can just commit to some communication strategy and then cannot uh, either modify the messages or censor the messages or issue the unjustified messages or anything like that. So this is it for information design. And more broadly, this is it for our mechanism design course. Thank you for being here. Thank you for going through it with me. It was a blast. So hope to see you maybe in future courses. Not, there are, not that there are so many. But yeah, bye everyone.